How confident are you about God's plan for your life? How confident are you about God's plan for your life? Is your preparation complete? Is your preparation to complete for whatever tomorrow may bring? I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. You know, Paul was there when Stephen was stoned to death. The early church was in its infancy. After Jesus' resurrection, his ascension, the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the brand new church, upon the followers of Jesus Christ, and the church was born. When the Spirit fell, the Spirit came within a very empowering presence, uh, a regenerating presence, a presence in, upon that, a power that came upon all those who believed. There was a new birth in the church. There was a new birth. The church was born. There was new life. There was a new beginning. And as more and more people heard and believed the message of Jesus Christ, Jesus' first disciples, his apostles, it became clear. Uh, I mean, they began getting, it became, became clear that their lives would be getting busier because more people were believing into the message. It was hard, going to be harder for them to devote time to prayer and time for the word. And so the Holy Spirit led them to choose some deacons, servants, people who could help them better serve the needs of the church, as the church was growing, people were believing the message. And one of those men was a man named Stephen. He was of good reputation. He was prepared to serve in the role that God had called him to. He was prepared by the word of God. He was filled with God's spirit, and he was fully confident about God's plan for his life. He was prepared by the word. He was filled with God's spirit, and he was fully prepared. He was fully confident about God's plan for his life. It was not a cockiness. It was a confidence about where he was going in the midst, even of a brutal trial. He still knew where he was going. He was still very confident about God's plan for his life, even when things got really bad for him. We're going to talk about that in just a moment, but let me first say, welcome to Columbia Life Church. I'm Pastor Yancey Valdez. This is the place where we believe life is too short to be stuck or weighed down by fear, worry, and self-doubt, and even worse, is letting, is letting the dark and troubling times we're living in right now discourage you, deflate you, um, derail your life. The good news is that we believe God can change all that. We believe God can change all that. We believe God can change all that. When life has gone sideways, we believe that God knows how to turn things around. When life has gone sideways, because we believe that with God, all things are possible. We believe that God, with God, all things are possible. This is why we gather together each week for uh, the preaching of God's word, for worship and the preaching of God's word, so that together we can create a sacred space for people to come and let God breathe new life and bring renewal into people's lives through faith, hope, and love in Jesus Christ. So if you're new with us today or uh, visiting us online, thank you for being here. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Let me give you a, a word of encouragement uh, to, to go to the... Um, a word of encouragement to go to the website, columbialifechurch.org. Follow along with today's service, clicking on the, on the tab that says, I'm new. We would love to be able to connect with you and know how we could best be praying for you and serve you in your faith journey as well. Stephen, let's get back to Stephen. Stephen was in a debate with the religious leaders. We're not, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm setting some context for our scripture today. We're going to be in Romans, but I wanted to share this story with you, found in the book of Acts. Stephen was in a, in a debate with religious leaders. He's one of the first... Um, deacons of the church, of the new church, and he saw Jesus in the middle of this debate that he's having. Uh, the people don't like what he's saying. The religious leaders don't like what he's saying, and so rather, they couldn't refute what he was saying, and so rather, since they could not beat him with their words, they decided to take up stones, and they started stoning him. Paul was there. He was watching the whole thing. In fact, he was holding the coats of those that were, stamp, that were going to stone Stephen, and this was the thing about Stephen. He saw Jesus in the middle of his suffering, in the middle of his suffering, he, God gave him a vision. He saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father in the place of honor. Everything he believed about Jesus was now being fortified as true in his own mind, in his own spirit. He was so confident, not cockiness in what he's done, but, but truly divine confidence in what Jesus had done. He was resurrected, and now he was exalted to the right hand of the Father. And the Father, as he had promised, poured out the Holy Spirit on those who believed in his message. The Bible says that he was, he was filled with grace. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He knew God's word. He was a man of complete integrity. Doesn't mean that he was, he was sinless, but he was blameless. Like grace would have been all over the flaws of his life. 
He would have been a vessel in which, in which the Spirit could be contained and overflowing because of the Holy Spirit that filled all the cracks in who he was. Grace filled his holes. He was so prepped. Many others would have, would have panicked under the pressure. Under the same kind of pressure, many others would have, would have panicked. They would have lived with a greater measure of fear. But that's what happens is we usually live with a greater measure of fear when we fail to remember who God is and what he has done. Stephen knew who God was. Stephen knew what he had, uh, who he was and what he had done. Stephen, it wasn't that Stephen may not have been fearful, but Stephen was very confident about God's plan for his life. He was very confident of where he was going. As he followed Christ, he also could trust him. He could, as he followed Christ, he also could trust Christ to lead him through suffering to joy. He could trust Christ to lead him through death to resurrection. He could trust guy, uh, Christ wherever Christ would lead him to. That even if it was going through a difficult time, if he still followed Christ, if he still followed Christ, Christ would lead him through that suffering, through that pain, through that turmoil, to that place where he was going to be. If you're following Christ, don't stop. Keep going. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't give up. You keep going because it's just a middle chapter. Just a middle chapter. You keep going. When we get back to Paul, Paul witnessed this all. This was part of Paul's life before Christ. And so we've been learning about how Paul has been given a second chance in life, how God not only just gave him a second chance, but he gave him a calling. Everybody that gets a second chance gets a calling to follow Jesus. You, you haven't been saved to sit on the sidelines. You've been saved for a purpose. Each and every one of us who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we have a purpose God has called us to fulfill. And we read from, from Paul's second chance. He writes this letter to the Romans, as we've been learning along the way. He's writing to the believers in Rome really about his, his take on the gospel. Paul has a certain, everybody has a story, and, and Paul's ministry is based out of his own story. So he's writing this letter to the Romans, and he's, he's bringing, this is my take on the gospel. This is what I believe to be true, as the Holy Spirit was filling him and penning the words and writing this. But his take on the gospel is that God's plan of salvation is for all people, not just for certain people, but for all people, all tribes, all nations, all languages, all skin colors, it doesn't matter where you come from. It is for every human being on the face of the planet, God's plan of salvation. And there's a consistency in Paul's letters. Not only do you write to the letter, of, uh, letter to Rome, but he also wrote to the Philippian church. In fact, in Philippians 4, 11 to 13, Paul says this. He says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in all things, in all things. In fact, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to, 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 be, to live in plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I have learned the secret of being content, content in any and every situation. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. When I'm going through a stuff that's very tough on me mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, relationally, vocationally, financially, I know the secret of being content in any and every situation. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. There's a consistency in Paul's, in Paul's letters and Paul's writings. And he writes that. He says, i got to remember, when he's writing to his letter to the book of, uh, to the church in Rome, he's writing to believers who are both Jewish and Gentiles, people who came out of a Jewish faith and people who came out of a paganistic culture. His letter of the gospel was for all peoples. And he begins to, to we're at this point in Romans chapter 10, as we're looking at the word of this, that, that when he's writing his gospel, he's basically saying, listen, my word the gospel that God has given me to share is not just for you. It's not just for you. It's, it's for everybody. It's a word for everybody. And he begins to, when he's talking to his Jewish audience, he's, he's trying to speak, to speak to them in a way like just the way the, the word of faith that comes to all people. It's kind of like the way the word of God came to you on Mount Sinai. When they were brought out of Egypt, and they went to the Mount Sinai, and, and Moses came down with the Ten Commandments. You've got to understand the power of this word that came to Israel. Once they were not a people, but now they became his people. The, 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 the law was supposed to be the instructions for them to have a relationship with God. The law would say, if you do this, we're going to have this kind of relationship. 
It was based on, on this law. You're, if you follow the word that I give you on Mount Sinai, if you follow these Ten Commandments, you're going to live differently than the way the, the paganistic people live. You're not going to have multiple gods. You're just going to have one God. Not multiple gods. You're not going to take insurance out on everything. You're just going to have one God. And it would begin with that. And he says, just as the word of God came to you on Mount Sinai, you've got to understand the word of faith comes to all people. And just as sanctified as those words on Mount Sinai set you, pe you people apart, you Jewish people apart, as God's people. So the message of faith comes to all who believe. And there's a relationship that is developed by all those who believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. And that he is now exalted to the place of highest honor at God's right hand. That same word, that same belief, the same reception of these words sets us apart. Same thing. Same thing. It's for different people. He says, he, he, you got to understand when the, when the um, one of the things that, that the, the people of Israel would have to recite is a, is a word of scripture in Deuteronomy 6, chapter 4 through 9. And it's, it's called the Shema. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Actually, it starts off, starts off like this. Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And that these words which I give you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligent to your, diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit, on, when you sit in your way, when you walk. Actually, I'm going to turn it there. There's a lot of words in there. I was doing pretty good. I was doing, I, I, I was doing pretty good, but we're flawed, right? We don't always remember. But these are the words. He said, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at your home and when you are on the road. When you are going to bed, when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your home and on your gates. He, they, I mean, the word that was given to them, they were supposed to keep it in their heart. It was supposed to be in their heart. It was supposed to be on their lips. It was supposed to be on their doorpost. Whenever they went to bed at night, they should be talking about it. Whenever they rose up in the morning, they should be talking about it. The word was supposed to be in their heart and their lips. As a result, you'd look at these people and say, you must have this relationship with God. Because all I hear about your, your whole life is wrapped around this God that gave you the word. And so he's, he's writing to the Romans, the, the Jewish believers who live in Rome. He says, the, it's, it's the word. The word is near you. It's on your lips and it's in your heart. And then he says this, our, our main scripture here. He says, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 10. He says, if you confess with your lips, Jesus Christ is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and is so justified, and one confesses with the mouth and is so saved. Verse 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everybody say everyone. 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 This was a huge word. This here is the trailhead of a new beginning. This here is the beginning of that, that trailhead that says, this, this, I'm leaving an old life. I used to confess other things. I used to say other things. There's, there's other things that used to be in my heart. There's other things that used to be in my lip. There was other things you would say I was a complete fan of. There was other things I threw my life and completely devoted it to. But that has all changed because there's only one God in my life now. It's a little different. There's, there's one person, and, and his name is Jesus Christ, that has come to the, the, the priority of my priority list. He's what, he's what needs to be, be the priority of my thinking, the priority of my actions. He shapes me for everything else I need to deal with in life because he gave me a brand new life. He says, for those of you that have never been on this trailhead before, or for some of you that, that may have gotten out, out of the path and you're, you're wondering, how do, I get, how do I get back right with God? He says, the trail is here. You confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's interesting because you go back and you look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah is an old, an old prophet. Um, but he prophesies in Scripture. These are hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. In Jeremiah 31, 31, 30, 
31, 31 through 34, he prophesies this. You've got to understand, again, hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, he says, the days are surely coming. Jeremiah is speaking to the people of Israel. He says, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God. And they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each another, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The new covenant. The new covenant. The word of God came to God's people on Mount Sinai. And as long as, as, long as they did their part, God would do their part. As, there was, there was, as long as you live this way, and it's going to look different from the rest of the pagan culture around you, there's going to be a relationship here. But the new covenant is based on, on a new covenant with better promises. The relationship is between the Father and the Son. And the Son has done everything the Father had asked, and the Father does everything that, that was agreed upon in the covenant. And we enter in because of what Jesus did. We enter in by faith because we receive the word that comes by faith. That if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, if you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will receive, here's another paraphrase, you will receive the promise of eternal life. You will receive, you will outlast the anguish that happens in the stuff that, that torments you mentally. You will outlast the stuff that torments your emotions, the stuff that's, that's physically hurting you in your physical body. You will outlast the worries of, of finances, the worries of a vocation, you will outlast. God will, he is the God of reconciliation to deal with all wrong relationships in your, right, in, in your life that things aren't going well with neighbors. And he is the one that, that, that truly satisfies the spiritual thirst that all human beings crave. He is the only one that brings resolution to everything every human being needs. And it doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter. He says, the word is near you, it's on your lips, and it's in your heart. This confidence that comes from God of receiving his word, of becoming his people, of, of, being, of, of, of coming into the kind, of becoming someone, someone like, like, like Stephen, who was able to face all kinds of adversity because he knew he had confidence in God's plan for his life. He had full confidence that God was able to do what he said he was going to do. Why is this confidence? And I'm not talking about cockiness. It's not cockiness. It's not, I haven't done every, anything, right? It's, 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 it's this relationship, this free gift that I have received, and it's based on what, what he's done. It's a confidence. You've got to understand, without a confidence that comes from God, we tend to panic under pressure. We tend to panic under the pressure. Without the peace that comes from Jesus Christ, we tend to panic under pressure. And, and isn't it funny how we're all different? I mean, I mean, I mean, not, you, you probably see me, you probably would see me panic under pressure, and, and it's so dumb why I would do this. But I, I can tell you that I probably get a little more emotional, and I don't know if that's even the right word, but, but I tend to get a, a little bit, a little bit, what's the word? You know what the word is. I'm not going to say it. You probably can't even say it in church. Anyway, no. I, 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 I would see that happening because, like, for instance, like, if I lost my keys. You've been there. I know I put the keys here. Come on, where did they go? I know they were here. I got to get going. I'm running late. Where are my keys? <laughs> right. It was in my jacket the whole time or something like that. I mean, isn't that so dumb? But isn't it true? I just got, I guess. Our confidence, I, you know, this confidence that comes from God. Without a confidence, without a, a daily consumption of the spiritual food I need to remind me of who he is in my life, a daily consumption of the spiritual food, the living water that I need to remind me in, in all those places of my life, my emotions, my mind, my physical body, that, that there was someone who died for me, that there was someone who was raised from the dead, and that there's someone sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, that he died to break the power of sin in my life. He, he, he rose from the dead to lead me into a place of freedom, not slavery, 
And he's up in heaven to take sovereignty over every circumstance in my life. Every battle that comes from way. The enemy may think he's trying to take me out, but if he's going to fight me, he's going to fight my God. That's just the way it works. You're not coming against, against God's people. You're coming against the God they serve. Every fight, every battle. It's not cockiness. It's him. It's all about him. In the middle of my fight, you know what the enemy needs to know? That Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what he needs to know. Because he wants you to forget that Jesus Christ is Lord. He wants to, Satan wants to tell you that Satan is Lord, but he's not. That's the lie. And we believe the lie, guess what happens? We start fearing. And we start getting scared. And we start losing our courage. And we start finding, we start, we'd rather, we'd rather run away than stand up and hold our ground firm. Jesus Christ is Lord. This is where the trailhead begins. I love how the scripture, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. Can you, you know, it's, there's another scripture in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that says, no one can say Jesus Christ is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. It's a serious, it's a serious power-filled word. Jesus Christ is Lord. If you're in a battle right now, you just, you just speak to what's attacking to you. It's one of the sharpest weapons you could ever use. You know something? Jesus Christ is Lord. He loves me. He's got a plan for my life. You can't change God's plan for my life. You can't change God's promises that he's given me, that I have in Christ. You can't change that. This, this, this is one of the greatest spiritual weapons. If you need a pocket knife, you pull that pocket knife out. And you just say, Jesus Christ is Lord. And you, you realize that you're not saying it by your own breath. No one can say it unless it comes by the Holy Spirit. And by faith, I'm saying that by the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying, can't say it on my own power. Scripture says I can't. Jesus Christ, it makes the demons shudder. It makes the enemy shudder, knowing that you really know the truth, that the fake news is not affecting you, that the lies are not affecting you, that you're living according to truth, not based upon lies. There could be a hundred people in the room who are fearful, but all it takes is one to say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. It's what, it's what we hear. Who, he's the one who comes when the Holy Spirit comes. He, he comes in, I can, I can name at least four kinds of power he comes in. Sometimes he comes with convicting power. Jesus Christ is Lord. To convict me of, of maybe things I'm walking in the wrong direction. Hey, that's not the direction you want to go. And so he convicts me. He says, walk in this way. He helps me get on track when my flawed mind wants to go a different direction or when my flesh wants to go in a different direction. When he's, you know, I need the reminder because I'm not perfect. I have this earthly flesh that, that wants to go after fleshly things and earthly things. I need the constant grace and reminder of the Holy Spirit to remind me and empower me, to convict me and say, hey, you know what? This, this may not lead to something that's going to last eternally. In fact, the road you may be going right now, you've got to understand what the end of that road is. It's a dead end. It's not the road that leads to everlasting life. There's only one road that leads to eternal life that, that helps us to be good stewards of the promise that we have through Jesus Christ. Sometimes he comes in convicting power. Sometimes he comes in regenerating power. You've been beaten down and you're exhausted, you're done with, but you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and all of a sudden you find yourself getting back up again. Well, it's me, Lord, I'm back. That's the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. The enemy's looking at you, you're back? Yeah. I just had a prayer with my Lord. I said, Lord, it's me again. What do you want to do about this? You, you've been pummeled like Rocky. You're all done. <laughs> you feel like you're all done. Your body's all done. Your mind is all done. You're spent. Your emotions are done. You, you have nothing left to give. You ever been in that place where you just have nothing left to give? But then what does God do? So I'm going to put a new... I'm going to put a new spirit in you. I'm going to put a new heart in you. I'm going to put a new spirit in you. And he begins just readjusting the clay, the dust, and guess what? <sighs> he breathes the breath of life in you again. You're like, I guess I'm back. That's what he does. Sometimes he comes with regenerating power. Sometimes he comes with enabling power. You don't know what to do, but then he, he comes in his... his 
the, the personality of the Holy Spirit, his mind interacts with our minds, and all of a sudden we're getting, well, shoot, with this regenerating power, there's a new life, new ideas, new, new potential, new vision. What do you want to do next? I knew that didn't work. Oh, do it this way. You know, God has a way of, of creating and crafting new things. This is, and, then, and then not only does he give you new ideas, he comes with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And it's like all of a sudden there's strength there because God says, I love you. I got a plan for your life. Let's walk towards this plan together. You don't have to walk through it alone. This, is, this, is, this comes and it starts with this trailhead that says, if you confess with your mouth, if you believe in your heart, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from dead. All things are possible, my friends. All things are possible. It all starts there. What an awesome God we serve. You look at someone like, like Stephen. He was being stoned to death. Yet we know that Stephen was a man who was prepared by the word. The word had so shaped his life for this hard time. No one wants to go into hard times. We all face different things in life, difficult things. But it's the word that reshapes us and prepares us for tomorrow. It's the word. That's why Sunday's so important when we gather together. It prepares us for the week. Puts us and just reminds us who God is. It's, it's God saying, this is who, who, you're gonna, who I know you can be in my life, who I know you are in my life. History has not changed. He died for us, and he rose from the dead. This is my hope. His banner over us is love. We lift up the, we lift up the banner. And for every battle we're going to face, you know, I'm going to pull out my pocket knife and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. This is what I believe. This is what I believe. Our confidence comes from his word that prepares us and his spirit that fills us. If we remember anything tomorrow, I want you to remember that. Our confidence comes from his word. His word that prepares us, that shapes us. It's not just about getting just a little word of encouragement to help you go on for today. The word's meant to reshape you, prepare you. You've been, you've been, trying, you've been trying to, uh, you've been trying to, to, to put together a door with a hammer and a nail, but God says, no, that's not going to work. I'm going I'm to transform you into a power drill because that's the tool you need right now. Sometimes we keep going with what we think we need for this situation. God says, no, 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 no. Let me, re, let me reshape some thinking. Let me reshape some emotions. Let me reshape something. Let me give you a new perspective because all of a sudden, that problem you're facing, it's going to be solvable in Christ. It's going to be solvable in Christ. And so when we're coming, we got, when we're coming and we're sitting down with Christ tomorrow morning, we're sitting in his word, it's, it's, it's God, reshape me today. What do you need me to hear how do you want to refashion me to face Monday or Tuesday or this week or this next season I find myself in the middle of it? God, help me to do that. Our confidence comes from his word that prepares us and then his spirit that fills us. So where do we start? Let me close with this. If you've never been there before or maybe you're a little off trail, I think, I think we need to be reminded of this every day. It's, it's a humbling experience to remember. You think about we've been going through this, this road to Rome. There's actually some some. So, uh, so a number of things that would be worth memorizing. It'd be worth having in your heart and on your lips when you have a book like this that says following Jesus. And God's going to bring people in your life. He's going to bless your ministry wherever you go because everybody has a ministry. Everybody has a ministry in which, in which God's going to bring people in your life that don't know where you've been. And in your journey, you found Christ. <laughs> and that's one of the most critical things you need to be able to share with people that may be going through a hard time. And you say, hey, you know what? I've got an answer for that problem. Yes. And so there's, 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 some, there's some stuff in Romans. Number, the, the first, we talked about it early in this series, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. His gospel is for all people, all tribes. None of us are perfect. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We've got to remember that. We have to be able to come to terms with the fact when we get on this trail that I'm admitting to you, Lord God, that I'm a sinner. I don't have it all. I can't have a relationship with you in my own power. I have to rely on Christ and Christ alone. It's the relationship that the Father has in the Son that I am invited into a new relationship, and that's with him. The second thing I need to remember is Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. I have to remember that in this verse, I have to understand that my sin without Christ, it's worthy of death. It's kind of like if I, was, if I ran the utility bill here for the church and I ran the heater on for an entire week, there's going to be a bill that's going to, that's going to come and that's going to need to be paid. 
because there was something that was, that was used. But with Christ, when I realize that there's, been, there's a payment, there's, there's something required for my sin and that, 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 that bill is death, this is what Christ done. He stamps that bill and he says, paid in full. And so we find that in Romans 5.8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, while I still had a debt to pay to make things right, he paid it for us. He died, he died to break the power of evil. He died to break that power of slavery over my life, to put me in a debt-free place that I may find forgiveness. He says, you don't, you don't have to pay that. I paid the price. And he was resurrected. He was resurrected to bring me into a place of freedom. Not in a place where I was constricted, but in a place of freedom. Do you realize Jesus is the only one of every human being, every human leader that, that supposedly was great in this world? Jesus, God was the only one that brought Jesus back to life. He was the only leader whose teaching said, love your neighbor or, or love your enemy as yourself. He was the only one. It's life-changing. It's boggling. And then he says this. The fourth thing to remember is what we're here today. We receive salvation and the promise of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. If you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Sometimes that's what people need. And then after they say the prayer of faith, you can, set, you can send them to something we read earlier in Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 5. And it talks about how there's no condemnation now for those who belong to Christ. There's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ. For the power of his life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Now we can live with confidence, not because of what we've done, but because of what he has done. And we have received him today in Jesus' name. Maybe you're here today. You're here today or you're listening online today. You've never made that prayer to receive Jesus, to receive, allow the Holy Spirit. Who's, he's here right now. The Holy Spirit will give witness to the, of whether the gospel is true or not. This is what happens when the word of God is preached. In a moment, we're going to pray for miracles, but before we do that, we want to give people an opportunity to get right with God, to receive Jesus, to get us to get us back on the straight and narrow when things have gotten sideways. Maybe you're going through a difficult time today. Maybe you're here today. You've been searching. Your, your soul has been thirsty. There's a spiritual thirst in your heart, and you realize the world cannot fill it. That's because the world cannot fill a void in your life that only God can fill. Only God can fill that void. But here's the thing. When the word of God is preached, Jesus said that, those that, 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 that his word is faithful and true, and those that would believe that his word is faithful and true, that this message that I've shared with you is faithful and true, also comes an invitation. An invitation to come and drink from that spiritual fountain of life and receive the promise of eternal life. you got, you got to hear me today. Everyone's going to die. But not everyone's going to die with the promise of eternal life. When, Pete, when Stephen was getting stoned that day, it was pretty obvious he was going to die. But he wasn't going to die without the promise of eternal life. He may have been stoned, he may have death, but, but he knew, he was fully convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor any other created thing would ever be able to separate him from the love of God that comes through Jesus Christ. I want that love. I want that confidence today. Maybe you're here today. You're in a place where you say, Pastor, I want to make a decision to follow Christ. Here's your chance today. Father, I want to pray for this moment right here today, Lord. I know there's some here today, and I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God. I know that right now you're knocking on the door. You're knocking on the door, Lord. And I know, Lord, that if we open that door today, you promise to come in and satisfy that spiritual thirst. I pray for those that or maybe wondering that today, and those that would say, Pastor, I, I want to receive, I want to, I want to receive that spirit, my, that, that living water to quench my spiritual thirst today. Lord, I pray for those that are here today. Maybe they've never made that prayer to go, prayer before. Maybe they, they are a Christian. Maybe, maybe they're just thirsty today, and they need a, they need a drink today. Lord, I pray for those today that you give, give us all, Lord, the grace to turn to you right now, the grace to believe in you right now, and the grace to receive. Your, your mercy, your grace, your salvation, that drink of living water, even right now, Lord. 
I pray, Lord God, as a result of what's going to happen today, that those that would put their faith and trust you would experience a, mm, an incredible forgiveness of sins, Lord. The peace that, that doesn't come from the world, but the peace that comes only from you in Jesus' name. Peace over their lives, peace over their circumstances, peace over their relationships. Hope for the future, Lord, in Jesus' name. Maybe you're here today, you say, I've never received Christ, but I want to make that decision today. I just want you to lift your heart, lift your hand to the Lord, say, God, this is me today. And let's say this prayer together. Dear Jesus, I'm so sorry. I have blown it so many times, and I'm sorry. I believe you died for me to pay the price for my sins and that you were raised from the dead to offer me a brand new life. Please come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your spirit and help me to live a life that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Lord, I pray for those that have said that prayer, that said that prayer today whether they've been on the journey for a while, maybe they said it for the very first time. Lord, I pray that your spirit would come upon your people right now in the name of Jesus, just in a mighty way, Lord. Remind those today, Lord God, that as you're turning them to you today, as you're offering, as you're giving them the promise of eternal life, Lord, that there is a cleansing, an overflowing that is coming from heaven to cleanse their hearts, their minds, their spirits today, to give them a fresh start, a new beginning. In the name of Jesus, Lord God. And we take a moment because, Lord, after the preaching of the gospel, we believe your word is true, that you said signs and wonders will come as supernatural proof that the gospel is real. Signs and wonders will follow, Lord God. And I'm praying for that right now in Jesus' name. Maybe you're here today, you have a miracle. Maybe you're listening online. online. You need a miracle today. You need God to come and move a mountain in your life. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray right now in the name of Jesus. Lift your heart. Lift your hand. You say, God, that's me. I need a miracle today. Father, I pray, Lord God, for those that need a miracle today. In the mighty name of Jesus, you've said in your word that signs and wonders will follow those who believe. Lord, for those that need a miracle today, maybe it's a, a, a physical need today, a financial need, a relationship that needs fixing. Maybe there's things going on. I don't know about it today, Lord, but I would pray you would open the floodgates of heaven, Lord, and meet each and every one of these needs with your miracle working power in the name of Jesus. Lay, may your grace flow from heaven and touch minds, touch hearts, touch, touch spirits, Lord, touch circumstances and situations that seem so overwhelming, Lord God. That in the name of Jesus, we would see your mighty hand move, Lord God. I come against every evil force and power of darkness that is coming against your people right now. In the name of Jesus, your word says that you have given us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And that whatever would be bound on earth would be bound in heaven. Whatever would be loosed upon earth would be loosed upon in heaven, Lord. And we rebuke the, the enemy in the name of Jesus. We say today, we profess from our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord. We believe in our hearts that God, you raised him from the dead. And that what he said, shared about himself it is true in the name of Jesus Lord may worship sp come like springs of living water within the hearts of your people that believe that we would put the enemy on the alert in the name of Jesus Lord I pray you would sanctify the road the path that you're calling your people to walk in specifically this week I believe Lord God you're going to open ways you're going to you're going to make a way where there seems to be no way in the name of Jesus where something seems impossible in a person's life in my brother's life in my sister's life where it seems absolutely un impossible Lord, I, I prophetically proclaim that you're going to make a way that seems to be no way Lord we may not see it coming, Lord God, but we're going to believe, Lord God, that you love us, Lord God. You've got a plan for our lives, and your plan cannot be foiled, Lord God. The enemy cannot uproot, Lord, what you have ordained in Jesus' name for our lives, for our families, for the calling you've called us to, Lord. We confidently believe, Lord God, that nothing's going to thwart your plan for each and every one of our lives, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. I also pray, even right now, Lord God, not only for just these specific needs, Lord, for each and every one's ministry here today, Lord, that you'd so fill them with your spirit, Lord God, that they would be a fountain of blessing for those that you would bring into their lives, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that the fire that has been ignited in their hearts, Lord God, would be fueled by the power 
of your Holy Spirit, Lord God. Put your words in their mouths and in their hearts today, Lord. I pray you would prepare them with your word as they spend time with you during the week, Lord. You'd fill them with your spirit, Lord God, and that you would receive all the glory, that nothing would be too difficult in their minds and their hearts and their spirits for them because of you. In Jesus' name, we can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives us strength. I pray this all. We pray this all in the name of Jesus and all God's people agree together. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a clap offering today in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And before, before we leave today, I, because I said this before we started, we got, we, you need to make sure the Lord has given each and every one of you a ministry. Take a couple of these. Keep one in your car. Keep one in your house. Keep one in your backpack or your purse or wherever you go because you never know when you might need this, okay? I believe God brings people into our lives, and we don't always know why or when, but it's good to be ready, you know? It's funny if you're able to have a conversation with somebody and, and, and just even be able to ask them, you know, do you know for sure where you're going to go if you were to die today? If you were to die today, do you, do you really know for sure where you would be going? And if they don't know, you have an answer. You have an answer. And so I want to encourage you, encourage you. Keep one with you. Keep one through. Do a Bible study. If you've never read through it, get acquainted with it. Because they may take one and they, they may come to back to you the next week and say, hey, I was reading about this in here. What do you know about it? Can you help me with this? And you, you may be the one that they're going to go to. Get acquainted with it. Um, I believe that if, if you develop your skill, if you develop your craft, if you develop those things that God has put in your heart, God's going to use you. God's going to use you. And he's going to strategically put you in places in the world, in places in your community, in places in people's lives where he needs you. Let the word of God grow in your heart. Let it be on your lips. And let Jesus Christ receive all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you for today. I ask for a great blessing to rest upon your people as you dismiss us today, Lord. We could not do what we're doing today without our family, our church family, our friends, our ministry partners. And so I thank you, Lord, for using them, bringing us together to make this gathering a, a place where you can be found, where you could breathe life, and where you could transform lives. And Father, I pray today as we give uh, those of that that are ministry partners, that are, are, are financial partners, Lord, I pray that as we invest, as we sow seed this week, Lord, whether it be here personally or online, Lord, that you would bless the offerings, Lord, the tithes and offerings of each person here as they give this week. Bless them in the lives of finances, Lord, um, in their workplaces, in their place of business, Lord. I pray for favor in the name of Jesus. I pray for promotions. I pray for increase, Lord God, so that your people can continue to do your will, so that it can continue to be a blessing in the lives of others, Lord. Bless their lives, bless their families, bless their ministry, Lord, and may your kingdom come, Lord. Show yourself powerful and mighty in a world that so desperately needs you, Lord. I pray for the spirit of the living God to rest upon your people this week, Lord, especially this week. May, they over, may it overflow from their hearts, um, into their minds, and into their spirits, through their words and through their actions, Lord. We'll give you the praise and the glory. Lord, bless your people. Keep them. Make your face shine upon them. Be gracious to them. Lift up your continents upon them and give them peace. May the name of the Lord our God. Be upon your people whom you promised to bless. Lord, I pray our day, our week, our lives would be thoroughly filled with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and that we would know that we serve an awesome God, an awesome God, an awesome God, who desires to bring out the best in us for life and for ministry. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen, amen. May his blessing go with you. Have a great lunch. Have a great afternoon. Have a great week. God bless you.